Welcome to episode 20 of the Graham Cochran Show, where I'm here to help you build your online business, work less and live and give more. I'm your host, Graham Cochran. We're talking about money this week. We talked about money last week in part one of this conversation. And we're going to continue that conversation because as business owners or hopeful business owners, we're just like the rest of the population. We have to manage money and it's critical that we figure out money management as a business owner. Otherwise, our businesses will not be around for long and our lives will fall apart because money, unfortunately, affects every area of our life. So we can't put our heads in the sand and ignore how to handle money. We want to be proactive, intentional, and we're not going to make it overwhelming, but I want to paint a few pictures. If you caught last week's episode, you know what I'm talking about. We talked about cash flow, the nuts and bolts of like bank accounts and managing money flowing from one account to the other. We talked about taxes. We talked about figuring out how to pay yourself a salary. We talked about um, setting aside profit and having a plan to intentionally set aside profit before your expenses, a lot of that. So very practical. And if you haven't listened to that episode 19, episode 19, go back and listen to that. So, so critical. In that episode, I made the case for um, when you do all the things right and you're managing your money right um, and it's time to make a profit or you do make a profit, even if it's 100 bucks a month, even if it's $1,000, there are three key things I want you to be doing with your profit. And we talked about one of those on last week's episode, which was building cash reserves. Business is cyclical, seasonal. We don't always have the cash we need on hand to pay our fixed expenses or our salaries even. So we need our own line of credit that we create. Instead of borrowing money to, to run our business, let's just do our own thing and do it with cash and have cash on hand. So that was probably the most important thing you could do with your profit. And we talked about how much you needed and what that looked like. It's kind of like a one-time deal. Uh, and I promised you that in this week's episode, we would dive into investing. And that's what we're going to be doing in steps two and three uh, of what to do with your profit. We're going to look at investing in two different ways. Um, super, super important. We're going to talk about real numbers here. <laughs> so this might get a little dorky, but you signed up for it. You're in in it to win it at this point. So we're going to cover all of that. Um, I'm really, really excited. So are you happy, okay, with me diving in? Because I can't wait to talk about this. And in fact, if I speak quickly, and if I speak with elevated pitch, and if this happens to go long, I hope it doesn't, please excuse me. I just like talking about this stuff. And I like talking about it, not just because I like money. Money is very helpful. It allows me to do really cool things. Um, but because managing money with wisdom and intentionality has changed my life. It's changed my life. Um, life is complicated and stressful and challenging enough as it is. Um, I didn't want to tack onto that money as an issue. Now, there are things that happen that you can't control that affect your money. I was laid off twice. Once because a whole department of the company was just let go, it wasn't needed anymore. And once because of the recession, um, couldn't control that. But the way we managed money in our household allowed those disruptions financially to not be as painful as they could have been. And there was no disunity between me and my wife. Not a lot of stress relationally because we have been managing our money thank God, with a lot of wisdom and intentionality for the entirety of our marriage the last th almost 14 years now. So you can control how you interact with money. And if you control it with intentionality and wisdom, it can smooth out a lot of the ups and downs of life, the things that you can't control. So I love how life has turned out as it relates to our money decisions. Can't predict the future. Can't predict the economy. I was just having this conversation with my wife last night about uh, the economy. It's 2019. Um, you know, there's there's indicators of a recession looming again. Um, it would make sense mathematically we're due for one in terms of the way these cycles are because it is cyclical. It's nothing new, um, but it's hard to know. I can't predict the future, but how we make decisions with our everyday finances, especially as business owners, how we manage the money in our business can be life or death in terms of sanity, peace, joy, and just one last thing to be stressed out about and fight about with your spouse and yourself. So I love this topic. So forgive me if I get excited. So beyond building cash reserves with your profit, 
You're, you're following what I'm teaching you. You're building a business. You're serving customers well, and they're buying your products or services. You're keeping your overhead low. You're paying yourself a fair salary, but a, a reasonable salary. You've, you've got your own line of credit that you've created basically with your cash reserves so you can be stabilized when you've got some lower seasons. And as more profit comes in now, what do you do with that profit? A lot of business owners just want to reinvest it into their business, hire more people, uh, get more training, which is a great thing. You can you could buy a course from me. Hey, I'm biased, but education has made me a lot of money. I'm a big fan of education, and I, I think my education that I sell will help you make a lot of money. But reinvest in education, reinvest by hiring, reinvest in tools that you need um, to expand your business. All great decisions, but a lot of entrepreneurs stop there. They think of investing as just investing in themselves. Don't want to do that. I love and can appreciate the concept of betting on yourself. Some people say it like this, choosing yourself, right? Choose yourself, bet on yourself. If you've got a great business, if you're sharp, if you're hardworking and diligent and you're honest and you have integrity and you serve people well, you're probably going to get the best rate of return on yourself. I get that. If you invested a hundred bucks in your business, you could probably turn that into a thousand dollars a lot easier than, I mean, that's ridiculous uh, percentage of growth, right? That's a thousand percent rate of return. Hard to get that anywhere else. So I get, and I'm all about investing in yourself and reinvesting in your business. What I would caution you, if you're thinking like that, I would caution you against only reinvesting in your business as your primary investment. To me, that's not strategic. That's not diversification. That's going all in on one company. I would never tell you, my friend, to go all in on one company with their stock. I wouldn't say put all your money on Amazon, even though they're crushing it. And they've been crushing it for 20 years. I wouldn't say put all your money on Facebook, even though Instagram is crushing it and they own Instagram. I wouldn't tell you to put all your money on Coca-Cola or Pepsi, even though they have hung around for decades because people still drink sugar water all over the world. I wouldn't. Because you just don't want to put everything you've got into one thing, right? Your grandmother said it best, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you drop that basket, they all break. Diversify, spread them around. So I won't bank just on myself, even though I believe in both Recording Revolution as a brand, it's got 10 years of, of history and it's only growing, even though I love this brand and this brand has done significantly better than I imagined in the first year of revenue. Even though it's a little baby, I wouldn't put everything into this brand. I don't trust myself to be um, untouchable. I don't know if the, the market will shift. I don't know. So I diversify. And there's two other areas I want you to invest in. And we'll get into very specific details. You ready? Let's dive in. Step number two, you got your profit. And last week we talked about a bunch of practical stuff. And then we finally got to what to do with your profit. Step one was build cash reserves. Step two is to pay off your debt. That's right. Pay off your debt. Oh, debt. Nobody likes to talk about it. It's not exciting to pay off debt. It's not glamorous. Uh, but if you want to be truly wealthy, you just can't let most of your debt linger. You just can't. Um, I like to listen to people that are smarter than me and richer than me. Uh, one of those is King Solomon. He lived around 970 BC, richest, wisest king of Israel. And uh, he said, quote, the borrower is slave to the lender. Ooh, check that out in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. The borrower is slave to the lender. It's interesting, as a Christian, the Bible never says that uh, debt is a sin. It's not something that God prohibits. Um, in fact, he tells the nation of Israel to lend it to other people. So if it were a sin, he wouldn't tell them to lend money to other people because then they'd be putting other people in sin. It's just that he wants his people to be free. That's the concept. That's what King Solomon is saying is like, if you borrow money, truth statement, you're a servant to the people you borrow money from. That's just all he's saying. You're in a servant position because you owe them. Some of your next month's revenue is spoken for because you have to make the debt service to the bank. So it's just sort of a truth claim. And it's one that's worth paying attention to. So let's talk about what that practically means. The best investment you'll ever make as a business if you have extra profit beyond getting your cash reserves is paying off your debt. There's a couple of reasons why. Um, debt 
gets in the way of you building more wealth because it eats up your income. If you have a lot of high payments, if you've got a line of credit in your business, if you've got um, just a business loan you borrowed to get started, if you've got personal debt, you know, car debt, credit card debt, student loan debt, that all those things have a claim on one part of your monthly salary or even quarterly bonus that you pay yourself. It's already spoken for. You're a servant to the lender that you borrowed it from. So if you didn't have that debt, you'd be able to keep all the money every month that you make and you could then reinvest it and grow wealth or at least just be a lot more at peace. So I say start with business debt. Hopefully, if you follow my advice, you won't have any. I don't believe in taking on any kind of business debt. Now, there are some businesses that that would be very hard to start without any kind of loan or line of credit. So I'm not condemning anybody that uses business debt, but if you're trying to build the kind of business that I'm teaching you how to build, there's no reason why you need to borrow any money. My very first video I put out on grahamcochran.com was how to start your business for $50 or less than $50. And I know that for a fact because that's how much it took to start my business. It's now a seven-figure business. I've never borrowed money for it. Started with 50 bucks. Hosting, a website, ability to collect payment through PayPal, put out content for free, email list building for free to get started. He doesn't take any money to get started these days. Now, I spend a little bit of money to run my business because they're better tools that can do a lot more, but they're still low cost. Like if you have a few hundred bucks a month, you could have like a super powerful online business, right? Kajabi, maybe it's like 150 bucks a month to get into Kajabi and you can do everything you'd ever need in a business, host your whole business on it. You don't need a, a loan to do $150 a month, okay? You just need to save up a little bit of money before you start, and then you're good to go. Start making a profit. So if you have business debt, though, that's the best thing to start paying off with your profit. Just chip away at it. Any business loans, any business credit cards that you have a balance on, any lines of credit, close them out. Um, And then attack personal debt, right? Because what you can do with your profit, you paid yourself a salary, you paid your business expenses, you paid any employees or contractors, you got your profit, if you paid off any business debt, you can start taking home some of that profit as a distribution to the one and only shareholder, which is you. Just transfer the money to your personal account. You can do it on a quarterly basis like the big businesses do. You can do it as a year-end bonus. You can do it whenever you want technically, but you transfer that money over um, and you use that to throw that profit at your car loans, right? At your student loans, at your credit card balance, even your mortgage if you want to. Just throw it at your personal debt. The reason you do this is, A, it's a guaranteed rate of return. So if your student loans are 6% interest, let's say, every dollar you throw at your student loan debt is a guaranteed 6% return because it's a guaranteed 6% on that dollar you do not have to pay in the future. So it doesn't matter if the stock market's bad, real estate's bad, you get a guaranteed return. So it's a no-brainer. Uh, in- increases your cash flow. The moment your car is paid off, you don't have that payment anymore. So now your income goes up by three, four, or 500 bucks a month for the typical American. It's the moment you pay off your student loans, you free up a bunch of your income. The moment you don't have that credit card balance, you free up that monthly minimum payment, right? It's all good. If you didn't have a mortgage, you'd have even more money per month. So you can see how the math is very compelling, very simple. Once you pay it off, you get more of your income back, which you can use to, hey, buy a lot of donuts for your friend Graham or take a nice vacation, or build more wealth, whatever you want to do. Um, And then what I love about no debt, it means lower cost of living. When you have no payments, you need less money to live off of, obvious, um, to keep that same lifestyle. And what this does as a business owner, this is so powerful, it takes the pressure off. takes the pressure off. It gives you more freedom as a business. You can try things. You can take risks in your business. You can launch a product that you're not sure how it'll do. You can work less. I'm a big fan of working less. I, I love growing businesses, but at, at some point you don't need more money. You just need more life. And what you want to do is find that sweet spot where you're making enough money and you have enough time to enjoy that money uh, and take care of your health and your family and your relationships. Then when you get that sweet spot, it's all working together. So Having no debt means no stress in your business, right? So huge, huge opportunity there for you is if you have debt, beyond building your cash reserves, which we talked about last week, I would set aside as much profit as you possibly can to pay off your debt. You have an opportunity that the average salaried employee 
neighbor of yours doesn't have. They have a fixed salary or monthly or hourly income that's just about the same. And they don't have an opportunity to have big swings of extra cash. They don't get bonuses very often. They don't have a chance for a huge influx of money. You do as a business owner. Let's say you have a launch and it goes really well and you have an extra $5,000 after that launch. That is something most people don't have in a given year. And so you have a privilege of taking that extra money that you don't need necessarily and using it to become closer to debt-free, free up your monthly expenses. So invest in your debt until you're debt-free. Now, there's another thing I want you to do with your money, and I want you to do that almost simultaneously. We'll talk about the nuances here in a minute. You don't want to just pay off debt. That's one of the best investments you can make. But money is, how do I put this? Money is a better worker than you are. Money is a better employee than you are. Uh, When you invest money, you're putting money to work. So, okay, you can make profit. Your business could be bringing you in an extra $5,000 a month that you don't need. Okay, let's use real real examples. Let's say your business brings in $4,000 a month and you pay yourself a salary and you have some expenses. You've built your cash reserves. You paid off debt. Um, Let's say you've got an extra $500 a month of profit. You could stuff it under a mattress, okay? Um, You could keep it in a bank savings account, earning 0.1%, or a high-yield online savings account at Capital One 360, let's say, earning 2%, or somewhere else. There's some bank accounts I've seen paying 2.5%. Back pre-recession, they were paying 5% at a bank account. 5% is crazy. Um, So you could do better by putting it in a bank account. But you could do even better if you invest those $500 a month in something that can grow. Money, as I said, a better worker than you. It never sleeps. It never takes breaks. It never gets tired. It's always efficient. It never takes maternity leave. No offense. Like, it just never takes a break. It's not a slacker like many American workers are that are in their butts and seats in corporate America. But what are they doing? They're, they're clicking through spreadsheets to look like they're busy, but they're just listening to a podcast on headphones. Money works harder than any person on planet Earth. So if you take money and put it to work, it can compound or grow dramatically. So what I want you to do is invest in three key areas. You're investing in debt, yes, but there's three other areas you want to be investing in or investing for. One, you invest for things. Do you need a new car one day? You need a new vehicle one day? Is that 15-year-old car you're still driving still safe and reliable means of transportation? Maybe, hopefully. If you bought a Japanese car, you're probably good. <laughs> if you bought an American car, uh, sorry. Um, so if you need to replace your vehicle, you have to prepare for that unless you're going to just borrow money the next time, which is a lazy and expensive way to pay for a vehicle. So invest ahead of time. What I have is an investment account that I pay myself a car payment, two car payments really, into this investment account and it grows. It's been earning interest. It's been doing very well because the stock market has been doing very well the last seven, eight years. Uh, And it's growing. It's earning interest. Instead of paying six, seven, eight percent interest to the bank to finance a vehicle, I'm earning eight, nine, 10, 11 percent interest or more on my car payment. And then you can pay cash for a new car or a gently used car every 10 years. Pay yourself the payment, grow that money so it becomes worth more money in a decade, cash it out and buy car cash and then rinse and repeat. So we all have to save up for cars, either paying the bank or paying yourself and earning interest. So invest for things you need, furniture for your house, whatever you need, a trip you wanna take, invest for things if it's long-term, right? Invest for experiences. That's what I was getting to. The next thing is, if you like to travel, you can have an investment account. You could invest for, um, and you could grow that stuff and then start to peel off bits of the investment to pay for your trips. It's just, you start to realize, I can invest for anything. Um, If you had money working for you, that could still you could peel off the interest for and still 
enjoy somewhat of a salary, you could go to the Bahamas or go to Spain and live for three months and your money would be paying you a salary, not you paying yourself a salary from working, your money. That's what investments can do. So invest for experiences if you wanna do that. Uh, and then invest for the future. And this is probably the most critical thing for all of us. All of us are gonna get old. All of us um, are gonna face unique challenges when we're older where we may not be able to work even if we want to, as well as the past, our mind not be might not be as sharp. Um, or we just might want to do something else when we're in our 60s or 70s or 80s. And so as a younger person, and you're younger if you're 50 or less is who I'm talking to, but it's the same true if you're in your 50s. If you're under 50, you have plenty of time to build up an income to ensure that you can continue to live in your older years. You create your own pension, right? That's what we had in America, at least for many, many years. You'd go to work at a company and you'd work hard for them for 20, 30 years, 40 years, and then you could retire. And part of your benefit was they'll pay you a salary every month for the rest of your life to retire. That's called a pension. Now, depending on how old you are, you might be laughing at that like that. I haven't even heard of something as crazy or ludicrous as that, but it's a real thing. They've gone away and now we have to prepare for our own retirement. We have to ensure an income for our future. Uh, and so that's what like retirement accounts are for. We'll talk about accounts in a second. Okay, conceptually makes sense. Invest for things, experiences in the future. Okay, make your money grow. Money making money is better than you making money or your business making money. Okay, and if you caught our cash flow quadrant episode, which we talked about just a few weeks ago, what episode was that? Episode... Looking for it. 13. Go listen to episode 13. One of the four um, ways you make money, one of the quadrants is the I quadrant, the investor quadrant. This is what we're talking about. And there's different things you can invest in. So one of the things to invest in that I recommend are stock index funds. Okay. I don't invest in single stocks because I don't know what stocks are going to do well. Um, so instead of banking on, again, one, two, 10, 20 companies that I think are going to do well, I bank on the U.S. economy as a whole. So what you can do, instead of just taking your money and just buying shares of Facebook or Amazon, you can buy shares of a pool of money that is spread out over, let's say, the S&P 500. You ever heard of that? The S&P 500 is a list. It's an index, which is just a list of the 500 largest U.S. companies as far as their um, how much revenue they bring in, right? Uh, and that list changes. And you've got Amazon and Apple and Facebook and Microsoft and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies and um, all kinds of companies, right? Everything you can imagine. All the big things are there. Um, supermarkets. There's a lot of big brands that are on the S&P 500. Airlines, hotels, whatever it is, right? The, the top 500 companies, it always changes. Coca-Cola, Pepsi. If I had 100 bucks, I could either buy a certain number of shares of Coke or I could buy teeny little bits of all 500 of those big companies. So now I'm putting my eggs across 500 baskets instead of one basket, right? The beautiful thing about these funds is that you're diversifying your money, spreading it around because nobody knows what company is going to do well next year. Even the best and brightest of us don't get this right. But the beautiful thing also is you're not just paying for a mutual fund manager, someone who's like, look, I'm going to select a bunch of stocks and diversify your money. And I'm going to put my degree to work and, and look ahead and see what I, what companies I think are going to do well, because I don't even trust that guy or that gal or that team of people. If you buy an index fund, there's no one to manage the fund because there's no thinking involved. They just, you just look at the list of the top 500 companies that are in the S&P 500 and you spread your money around those 500. So there's no humans that need to be involved. And that means the fees are much lower because there's, you're not really paying for much. It's very simple. You're paying for a company like Vanguard or Fidelity or T. Rowe Price or somebody to take your money and put it in their fund, which just then splits it over those 500 companies. So you keep more of your money because you pay like 0.1% of fees, where the average mutual fund might be 1% to 2% fees, which is so you're way less, right? Um, a 20th of what the, the fees would be, 5% of what you'd pay somewhere else. A lot, 95% off the fees if you want to look at it that way. So index funds are cheaper and you're going to get what the market's giving you. Now, what does the market give you? Well, it just depends on the day. 
It's up and down, up and down. My youngest daughter, I'm teaching her how to invest. And so I'm teaching her by using individual stocks, single stocks, um, because it's easy and it's simple for her to understand and learn the concepts. When she gets older and she's putting big money into it, I'm going to teach her to put it into index funds. But we started with Disney. She saved up to buy her first share of a company and she bought one share of Disney because she likes Disney. She understands what Disney is. Coca-Cola, she would understand. McDonald's, she would understand. Any of these would have been fine. Target, she understands for better or for worse, sometimes worse. But Disney, she understands. She watches the movies. She's been to the Magic Kingdom at Disney World, right? She likes Star Wars. Um, She understands that these are all Disney products. So she understands what she's buying into. And so it's funny because she saved up uh, $70. I matched dollar for dollar whatever she would save towards stocks to teach her about 401k matching and to incentivize her to save up to invest. Because Disney at the time when we bought one share was $140. So she saved up 70. I matched it with 70 when we bought one share of Disney stock um, through a custodial account in her name. Uh, And what's funny is it went up to 143 the next week. And I was like, Chloe, you made money. You made three bucks without doing anything. And she was like, yes, that's like cleaning my bunny's cage three times. And I did that three bucks without having to do any work. She loved it. And then last week, she was like, how much is my stock worth? I was like, oh, it's back down to 140. She's like, what do you you mean? She's like, you mean it went down? It's like, yeah, stocks can go down. She was like completely confused. I've explained this to her a million times, but she's like, well, that's not cool. I'm like, Chloe, that's the whole point. These companies are going to go up and down, up and down, depending on what China is doing, what Trump is saying, what anybody's doing, how their products are performing. If the new Star Wars movie comes out in December and it's awful, it's going to go down, right? Doesn't We can't control that. We're banking on the U.S. economy over 20, 30 years. And we're bank, We're looking at the past. What has the U.S. economy done through World War I, World War II, you know, the Korean War, September 11th, the Cold War, like multiple recessions. What has it done? 9% average annualized since for the last 145 years. The last 145 years it's been way up, it's been way down, but if you kept your money in, including the negative years, because the average is gonna be higher, but annualized gives you a true number of what your money would have done if you kept it in stocks, the US stock market, S&P 500, 9%. That's a great rate of return, a great rate of return. At that kind of rate of return, 100 bucks a month getting that kind of rate of return, well, let's look it up. Actually, don't know the exact on 9%. If you ever want to do this, go to a compound interest calculator on Google. Money Chimp has a good one. If you started with $0 and you put in 100 bucks a month, that's 1200 a year. And if you're 25 years old and you do this for the next 40 years and you earn 9% on your money, that turned into $441,000. Okay, you've invested 1,200 times 40. You've only put in $48,000 and your money's turned into $441,000. Okay, that's $400,000 of free money. You only put in 48, you got 400 extra. What did that come from? 9% average compounding. The compound interest, that's free money. It's almost half a million dollars you're giving up. That's only if you put 100 bucks in. You're a business owner. What if you put 500 a month in? What did you put a thousand a month in just into your retirement account and invested it in basic index funds? In 40 years, in 30 years, in 20 years, you'd have a lot more money. So that's the idea is compounding is powerful. <laughs> I'd already written out the notes, I'd already done the math for myself, and here I am typing it in. But it was correct. My notes were correct. That's awesome. Good for me. What I love about stocks is their growth because you're not. Stocks, people are like, what are you just investing in? It's just paper. No, you're investing in companies, just like your company. You're working hard every day to try to come up with new products or services. You're you're listening to your audience. You're listening to your market. You're reacting to the, the economy. You're trying to figure out what would be valuable to create a profit. That's what every company's trying to do. So by investing in stocks, you're funding their venture and you're writing off their coattails their ingenuity, their innovation, their team working hard, doing the same kind of thing you're doing, but in different markets. 
So it's not just paper. You're investing in human capital. You're investing in real people trying to create wealth by creating value in the marketplace. So if you believe that stock, the stock market is risky, then you don't believe in the economy long-term. You must have a negative outlook on the economy long-term, which is fair. If you think in 30 years, there'll be no Home Depot or Home Depot equivalent, no Walmart or Walmart equivalent, no Apple or Apple equivalent, no Facebook or Facebook equivalent. If you think that there'll be no company making money in 30 years, why would you invest? You probably wouldn't. But if you think in 30 years, there's gonna be some company replacing all the other companies that die off in the S&P 500, making a product, serving people well, selling basic things like healthcare and phones and internet access or whatever, if you think they're going to be around in 30 years, then you should invest in them now because they're going to be worth more in 30 years. Okay? That's the idea. So I love stocks because of their growth and I'm buying into companies. What I don't love about stocks is they're volatile. They go up and down, right? Like an emotional teenager. One day they're your friend, the next day they're slamming the door in your face. That's what the stock market is. It's like an irrational, emotional teen. No offense if you're a teenager, but I've been one. I know what I was like, okay? I've got two daughters. I'm about to experience that in the next five years, okay? Emotions. That's what the stock market is. So it's not stable. It's predictable over 40 years to a certain degree, but not predictable day to day, month to month, or even year to year. So to stabilize some of that, I'm a big fan of bonds and specifically bond funds. If you ever heard of bonds, what is a bond? Instead of buying a company, you're lending money to an organization or the government. You're lending them money. It's an IOU. They're like, hey, buy $1,000 worth of bonds. It's just, you're not buying anything. You're lending $1,000 and they promise to pay you the thousand back plus interest. That's what the interest rate is on the bond. So if they are promising you 4% interest, you're lending money out at 4%, just like a bank lends money. That's how banks make money all day long, lending money primarily for mortgages and car loans and credit cards and student loans, things like that. So I'm a big fan of bonds, specifically stable U.S. government bonds. They're very boring. They're not as, uh, they don't pay out as much as municipal bonds for certain cities or counties or states or projects, but they're more stable because the government always can pay their bills. Why? Because they can print money whenever they want. That's how they pay their bills. So for better or worse, I like inflation-protected bonds, otherwise known as the TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. All it means is they average about 3 to 5% growth. It's maybe a lower interest rate, but it's tied to inflation. So if inflation is high, they increase what they pay. And it just is a smoother ride than stocks. And so I like to blend the two together. I invest relatively conservatively, according to all the literature at my age, 50-50 stocks and bonds. 50-50 stocks and bonds. So my personal retirement funds comprise 50% in stock index funds, specifically the total stock market index fund, which buys every company in the US, not even just the 500 on the S&P 500, every company. So half of my money is going in the US stock market through index fund, half of my money going to government bonds through another index fund, um, through treasury inflation, inflation protected securities, TIPS, okay? Um, the beauty of this 50-50 approach is you're, it's like a two-horse race and you own both horses, okay? In 2000, there was a stock market crash, 2000, right? The tech bubble burst. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, but that was a big deal. Everybody was making money in the stock market. It was easy. The NASDAQ was through the roof. Just buy a .com and sit on it and make money, whatever. Start a business that doesn't even sell a product and you become worth more and somebody buys you out. It's, it was stupid. Stock market crash, 2000, 2001, if you were 100% stocks, even in an index fund, you would have lost easily 40, 50% of your, your money. A huge drop. But people that had 50, 50 stocks and bonds, bonds actually took off. They did really well because when people get scared of stocks, they run to bonds and then bonds become worth more. So if you had a 50, 50 stock bond portfolio in that stock market crash, you would have not only not lost money, you would have stabilized and then when the market came back, because the stock market came back, it crashed again in 08, but it's come back. Record high. Stock market always comes back, by the way. It always will. I'm a huge fan of stocks. But you would have made more money because you didn't lose as much because half of your money was in bonds. So you lose some of the stocks, but the bonds stayed the same. So when it all came back, you actually would have made out better than if you were 100% stocks. Now, it's going to be different in the future, and bonds don't always correlate with stocks or they're not always different. Sometimes they both can go down as we saw in 08. It's hard to predict, but the point is, is there are different animals. 
One's a little bit smoother than the other. And you're not, again, it's another form of diversification. You're not banking on any one thing. So I like simple 50-50 approach. Half of my money in a stock index fund, total stock index, half of them in a government bond index fund. That's how I roll. But there's certainly a, t- a ton of literature out there on different ways to think about investing based off of your age and your goals. Um, but you need stocks for growth. You need bonds for um, protecting you from those massive drops. A 50% drop means you need a 100 per, 100% growth to get back to where you were. Yeah. If you if you, the market tanks 50%, you need it to do 100% better for you to get back even. It's a huge uphill swing. So I like to diversify through stocks and bonds. That's the what you can invest in. Very low cost, very easy, just transferring some money from your business account or your personal account. Now, when people think about investing, a lot of times they talk about 401ks and retirement accounts, and they think that that is an investment, okay? Retirement accounts, like a 401k or an IRA or a 403b or a SEP IRA. If you've heard of any of these things, if you're in the US and you have different, they're called something different in the UK and Australia and different countries. All of these are names of types of accounts that have some kind of tax advantage. They're just buckets. They're not the investment themselves. They're just a holding tank for your investments that have tax advantages. For example, if I'm you, I'm a business owner, I would open up, and I'm in the US, I would open up a solo 401k or an individual 401k today, or a SEP IRA, very similar. What this is, is an account that you can put business profit into and it's not taxed. So if you made $10,000 extra one year in your business, if you put that money into this account, you won't pay taxes on that $10,000, which saves your tax bill that year. That's huge. Now it's not tax free, it's tax deferred, meaning let's defer when you pay taxes to later. So you don't pay taxes now, you can put it in this account, the government lets you do it, we'll talk about limits in a second, and you can use that money to then invest in these index funds I've been talking to you about. So you can get growth on your money plus the government's money, money that they would have taxed you on and taken out of your account and just used to pay for something dumb probably, or probably other good things too. The government does good things, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be cynical. But you get to keep more of your money and have that money grow and make more money for you. You don't pay taxes then. You don't pay taxes every year. There's no capital gains taxes like normal investments. You pay no tax until you take it out in your 60s and beyond, which is amazing. That gives you more opportunity for compounding interest on money that would have been the government's. The beauty of these accounts, and it changes every year, so check the math now. You can just Google what the the limits are, contribution limits. But as of right now, it's about $53,000 a year you can put into your individual 401k, which is incredible. You can tax shelter 53,000 or more a year of your business profit into one of these accounts and grow that money and not pay taxes on it. That's huge. Depending on your tax bracket, that could save you $25,000 a year of extra money that you get to then invest Super, super cool. The negative of accounts like this is that the money's locked up. The money's locked up, so they usually have a penalty that if you were to pull the money out before your 59 and a half birthday, you not only start to pay the taxes on it, because when you take it out, you pay taxes, which is gonna happen whenever you take it out, but there's a 10% early withdrawal penalty. Most of the time, there are some ways to get around that later in life. So this is not a good place to put money for short-term goals like buying a car or paying for your kid's college. Use a different type of account for college. Look up a 529 plan, okay? Look that up. See if your state offers one of those. For cars, just open up a normal taxable account, a brokerage account. Go to wherever you have your 401k. Go to vanguard.com. Go to fidelity.com. Go any of these places and just say, I want to buy some index funds. You're not putting it in a 401k. There's no account. You can just buy the fund. Problem is you'll pay taxes every year on the growth. It's called capital gains, that's normal. But the good news is it's lower than your personal tax rate and there's not a lot of turnover on index funds so you probably won't realize a lot of profit year to year because there's not any selling that's happening. You only pay capital gains when you sell an investment and it's made a profit. If a lot of this so far is over your head, don't worry. I'm gonna give you some resources at the end of some books that I recommend that might be helpful for you. But that's how I would recommend. You got to have a retirement account. As a business owner, you have an opportunity to shovel so much money in that account and grow an amazing retirement for your family for the future. Huge. 
you have more opportunity than the average person has. The average employee in America right now, if they have a 401k at work or a 403b, which is the same, or let's say a TSA, not TSA, TSP, excuse me, thrift savings plan if you're in the military, um, the numbers are around 19,000 a year is the max you can contribute. Now that's, most people don't do that because most people don't, they have too much debt so they can't afford it. They live too big of a lifestyle for their income so they can't afford it. And they're not worried about their future. So they're, they're being a little unwise and foolish. But if you have no debt, you can easily max that out. Even on a decently mid-sized median income, that's about a thousand bucks a month. That would be smart. But as a, a business owner, you're not limited to that 19,000. Like I said, with the individual 401k, you can put upwards of 53,000 in depending on how much your salary is through both your normal 401k contributions and what they call profit sharing. It's so powerful what you have available to you as a business owner. So you can invest in stocks. You can invest in bonds through all through index funds in retirement accounts, outside of retirement accounts. I do both. You can also invest in real estate. I love real estate so much. It's so simple of a concept. It's real. It's tangible. All of us have to live somewhere so we understand real estate, I think, inherently better than we do stocks and bonds. Um, but there's some caveats. So rental real estate is a good bet. When you think about buying a property that someone else can rent from you, it's very simple. It's stable income because you have they have... They signed a lease. They signed a contract to pay you a certain amount every month. And if you buy rental real estate right, you're making a profit. And it's like guaranteed because you know at least for the next 12 months, you've got a guaranteed return on your investment. Um, it's pretty stable. Now, it's going to be a lower return depending on how you buy it. Lower cash flow, like cash on cash return depending on how you buy it. Um, and it depends on where you buy and how much house you buy. You need to be strategic. And there's a lot to read on this to be strategic. You want to do your research. I'm a big fan of median homes. So look around your neighborhood. Look around your city. What's the median size? Median price. I love three bed, two bath as a concept. These are single family homes I love that are just in decent neighborhoods. They don't have to be the best neighborhood, but just a good neighborhood. Three, ba three bed, two bath. It's perfect for most families. If you get too big, it's going to cost you too much and you're going to have to charge too much in rent and it's not going to fit most people's budgets. So you want to think about what's rentable. Um, and again, you're going to get guaranteed cash flow every month if you buy it right. You're going to get property appreciation because now you own a property that's going up in value and properties typically keep up. They keep pace with inflation. Yes, some years, like the last few years, we've had great growth in real estate nationwide, especially in Florida and Tampa. Uh, but that's not realistic. We're, we're, we're coming out of a recession and we've had just huge growth. If you average it out, at best, it keeps up with inflation, which is about 3 to 4% a year. So bank on 3% growth, which could be huge. On an expensive property, um, on a $200,000 house, 3% is a lot, right? Um, that's like six grand a year. So you get that appreciation. And then if you buy with a mortgage, and the rent is covering your costs, you get debt pay down. So that's the beautiful thing. If you own a piece of real estate, let's just say it's your own house. Maybe it's a starter home that you lived in. That's how I got into rental real estate to start out with is we had a house that we lived in and then we moved up in house. I needed a home office. We had more money. I wanted to live in a nicer neighborhood. So we bought another house, but we kept the first house and we rented it out. And we've been renting it for seven years. And so what you do is the tenant comes in and if your math is right and if you bought it right and your expenses are low enough between the mortgage, the taxes, the insurance, if you have an HOA or a CDD, I even had money in my budget for a property manager, which I highly recommend so that you're not taking phone calls when the toilet breaks and you're not doing credit checks to get a tenant in there and you're not the point of contact, period. You don't even have to market it. They put a tenant in there. They do everything. They collect payment and make sure I get paid. They're worth their weight in gold. I had enough in my budget that I could charge a fair market rent and it would cover all my costs and still put $100, $200 a month in my pocket. Now, what do you do with that money? You set it aside in savings because guess what? The AC is going to break. The carpet's going to need to be replaced. The fridge is going to break, et cetera, et cetera. That gets into the downsides of owning real estate is their money pits. Anybody that tells you about the glories of real estate without telling you about the realities of real estate, run far away. They're money pits. So you need to be careful here. The beautiful thing, though, for you is that you are a business owner now. 
you again have the ability to create more profit and wealth than most people do. So you can set aside more cash. If you buy a rental property, you not only need money for the down payment and the closing costs, and you need to make sure that the rent will cover all your costs plus more. For sure, you need that, but you need cash reserves just for that property. When you have a vacancy, that's going to happen. When you need to replace the carpet, when you need to replace the AC, all these things. I just spent $10,000 to renovate a kitchen in my rental property, okay? I didn't need to do that, but it, it, it kind of needed it, right? Um, and I want to take care of my property so it, it stays valuable to tenants, right? So all of that, you have the ability to, to reinvest in your property because it will eat cash, it will eat cash. So the benefit of the property is either, if you want to, you can pay cash for a property if you're just cash flowing like crazy in your business and you're like, dude, I could buy $150,000 cash, house cash. Well, good for you. If you can't, it's okay. I'm not opposed to you buying a rental property with a mortgage. You're probably gonna have to put 20 to 25% down. You're gonna have to get a proof of a lease. You're gonna have to go through more hoops um, unless it's your own personal residence that you start to rent out, then you don't have to apply for a mortgage because you already have one on the property. But you're going to need to put some money down. You're going to need to buy the right place, not the house you love, but the house that's rentable and look at what rents are in that area. Even get a, re a realtor to go out there and take a look and see what the rent should go for if you really want to be uh, in the know. And then you want to have cash set aside and realize that even if you're just breaking even, they're paying your mortgage and all your taxes and insurance and HOA and property manager and their extra cash flow is paying for repairs. If you break even, you're making money in two huge ways. Debt pay down, because every month part of what they're paying you is paying off your mortgage and property appreciation. Even if you break even, it can be worth it to have a rental property because in 20 years it'll be paid off. 30 years it'll be paid off. It's an amazing tool to have when someone else is paying your mortgage. So real estate can be great. We bought this, this, uh, this office space here to work out of, but also as an investment property. We can turn it into a rental when we want to, um, or we can just work out of it and just keep it. It's in a really good area downtown, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to appreciate so it's like I'm getting multifunction out of it. It's not rental real estate, but it's still an investment. I believe that my house, my rental property, this, this unit here are going to cost more and be worth more in 10 to 20 years than they are now. I don't believe they will be cheaper in 10 to 20 years than they are now. Now, they may dip in a little bit. We might have a correction. But in 20 years, do I think real estate in Tampa is going to be cheaper or more expensive than it is now? On the whole, I think it's going to be more expensive. So it's very simple. You're buying something that you think will go up. And if someone else can pay for it the whole time while you hold on to it, even better. If it's debt-free and you can make cash flow off of it every month, then you get trifecta. Debt paid, uh, you don't even have debt pay down. It's just all cash flow and appreciation, which is sweet. So you see what we've done so far? This is a lot. In the last two episodes, if you put them together, beyond the foundational stuff, beyond the bank accounts being set up right and, and figuring out a conservative salary to pay yourself and making sure you're paying your taxes and you're getting everything flowing well and you're setting aside some profit. What do you do with that profit? We talked about three things. Cash reserves, three to six months of expenses set aside in the bank, separate from your business account, right? Cash reserves, your own line of credit. Paying off debt, one of the best investments you can make. Guaranteed interest, guaranteed rate of return, excuse me. Reduce stress, increase your cash flow every month. Wonderful, takes the pressure off your business so you can just chill or try crazy things and if they don't work, no big deal. I hate pressure in my business. I wanna enjoy my business and enjoy my life, right? I wanna be working less and living more. I don't wanna be stressed out more. So reduce your stress by paying off debt. And then three, invest for growth. Because here's the deal, and we'll wrap up here. We talked about, banking on yourself. Again, I don't want to trust my business alone. That's not diversif diversification. That's really making a risky bet because I don't have a crystal ball. You know, in the book of James, in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon says the same thing that don't boast about tomorrow because you don't know what a day may bring. So 
I am all on the Graham Cochran train. I believe in both of my businesses more than you do, more than anybody does, because they're my businesses. It's what I work on every day. But I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I'm not going to boast. Boasting looks like I'm banking on myself. In a way, that's functionally boasting. I, I haven't lived a long, long life, and I've lived long enough to see ups and downs and to know that not anything is guaranteed forever. So I'm going to diversify. I'm going to invest in my business, but you know what? I'm going to invest in other people's businesses through the stock market. I'm going to invest in uh, a stable uh, borrower in the U.S. government. They will always pay the bills, so I'll buy bonds. They're stable. I'm going to invest in real estate because people always are going to need a place to live. When the recessions come, that's when people become even renters even more. So rental real estate is always a long-term bet if you've got the cash to handle the cash monster that is real estate, right? And if you buy right. I'm going to bank on different things, stocks, bonds, real estate. I might even invest in personal friendships in their businesses. If I have a friend that comes to me, he's like, I want to do this and open up this business, but I need 20K and I don't have it, but I'm willing to put in the work. I could give him the 20K and become an investor in his business and get a royalty every month off that business. That's a way to make my money make me more money. It's all about diversifying and not banking on yourself. And at the very least, what I want you to do when we walk away from this long conversation is I want you to open up a retirement account today. And at the very least, put 50 bucks a month into it. At the very least, you owe it to yourself to start today. Money can make more money if you have it invested longer. We cannot get our time back, so invest today. You will regret it five years from now if you wait five years to invest. I don't care what the market's doing. I don't care if the market tanks tomorrow. You invest today. Why? Because you don't lose the thing you own. It's just gone down in value temporarily. It will come back. You're not investing for tomorrow. You're investing for 30, 40 years from now, 20 years from now, 10 years from now. So start investing now. Take advantage of all the amazing things that your government gives you. Tax advantage accounts like IRAs and 401ks. Simple investments that are low cost and, and lower risk and easy to understand like index funds. Buy a home and live in it. Not the best investment from a purely investment standpoint, but man, if you're going to pay rent somewhere, buy a home that you can afford, that you can afford and build equity and have debt pay down instead of just paying rent. If it makes sense to you and you're going to be in that area for a while. Buy a rental property if you can. These are very boring, simple things that if you do it right, will make you money over the long term. You don't have to be a genius to do this. This is not, we're not gambling here. We're not going to Vegas and saying, I'm going to put $1,000 on the blackjack table and hope it turns into $10,000. I don't live like that. I look at data and make smart decisions. And if you look at 145 years of the stock market, very smart decision to invest. You look at real estate, just because of inflation, cost of goods and work going up, houses are just going to cost more. 50 years from now, houses are going to cost way more than they cost now. It's just, it's obvious. People need a place to live. It's obvious. Do the obvious things. Get tax breaks, slow, boring growth, but start now and let your money make money so that you're not just banking on your business. Because at some point, my friend, you may not even want to do your business forever. You just might be tired of it. Do you want in 10 years to have had a great run, a great run, and hopefully your business is super profitable. And if you follow my advice, I'm, I'm rooting for you and I'm here to, every week to coach you, to grow your business. Hopefully you have a great run, 10 years, great lifestyle. You're able to give a lot of money away, uh, which we talked about a couple episodes ago, which is, I think, the noblest investment you can make, the highest returns you can make. Um, and that's why I didn't talk about it in this episode because we kind of already touched on my passion for giving there. But we can we can do a whole episode on that too if you want. Let me know if you want me to talk more about um, charitable work and giving financially as a business. But you can live a great life, give some money away, have some fun, serve your customers. If your business dries up because the market shifts or you're just burned out and tired, will you regret not having paid off debt and investing in your retirement account, maybe buying a rental property? Probably. Think about yourself 10 years from now if you stopped your business because you just 
don't want to do it anymore, or you can't, or you need to take care of an aging parent or a sick child, or something happens in your life where you just, you have to change the way you make an income and you can't run your business anymore, or you don't want to, what would you regret not having done with that profit? Maybe think about it that way. I want you to have fun. I want you to enhance your lifestyle with your business. You work hard, you deserve it. I'm not ashamed to take a nice trip or to go to a nice restaurant or live in a nice neighborhood or drive a nice car. I want to enjoy my money, but I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to have a nice run for 10, 15, 20 years. And then at the end of it, however God decides to end that run, I don't want to look back and be like, dang, I should have been investing in my retirement account. I should have paid off debt. I should have maybe bought a rental house. I don't want to regret that. I want to use my business profit wisely month in and month out in good times and in bad times so that there's no regrets. I'm diversifying. I'm thinking strategically. And if it's all done, I can say, hey, at least my business not only provided for my family's needs for those 10 years, but it built some wealth along the way. Now, I said I was going to mention some books, a couple of books that come to mind. Um, Daniel Solon has a great book called The Best, excuse me, The Smartest Investment Book You'll Ever Read. The Smartest Investment Book You'll Ever Read by Daniel Solon. It's a very arrogant title, but the reason why he titles it that is because it's, by God's grace, the shortest investment book I've ever read, meaning it's the only one most people will actually read. That's the whole point of the title. I love the, the humor in it. Um, it's brilliant. He's absolutely right, but he just took everything that anyone's ever written or said, and himself included, about um, investing, specifically the power of index funds and why you can't time the market and you don't know what stocks to pick and the best and brightest of us don't get it right. There's an amazing story in the beginning chapter of that about this contest that a, uh, a UK newspaper runs every year where they get a, a kid, uh, a monkey, a uh, fortune teller, and then a professional stock picker to pick stocks at the beginning of the year and see who, uh, who did the best at the end of the year, which stocks did the best. It's a competition every year. You can take a guess at who you think wins. It's not the stockbroker, by the way, the stock picker. Um, his whole point in that book is that you can't predict the future. Nobody can. So you bet on the market. And he's got very short chapters, like sometimes one-page chapters. Very short, very actionable. You get all kinds of data and actionable stuff to put together a portfolio for your retirement account or whatever. So the smartest investment book you'll ever read by Daniel Solon is a great place to start if you want to learn more about um, index investing. I would also say, um, what is the book on real estate? Um, the guy that started Keller Williams. What is that book? Let me pull it up here in my Kindle. Sorry, I should have written this one down because this is another good one as well. I don't want you to miss this one because if you're really into rental real estate and you want like the nuts and bolts, um, it's The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Millionaire Real Estate Investor um, by Gary Keller. So Gary Keller started Keller Williams Realty. And um, he's not only a real estate agent or was and has a great company there, but he's a real estate investor. And so this book, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, is thick, but it's very much practical how to get into rental real estate. Uh, it's kind of a big one. Um, there are a lot of shorter ones on there that are a little more nuts and bolts. Um, another good example on the real estate side of things would be, uh, what's another good one? Buy and hold forever, I think, is the one I'm thinking of. Sorry, guys. Should have pulled this up. I think it's buy and hold forever. And that's by Schumacher, I think. Um, David Schumacher. Buy and hold forever is another good one. That's more conceptual and more stories, but I like The Millionaire Investor, uh, Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller because it's very nuts and bolts and practical. So just some resources for you. There's so many. Um, just message me if you want more and we can dive into some more books uh, on investing in particular. Um, again, some great places to do your investing if you're in the US. Uh, I do a lot of investing through Vanguard. Uh, I love them because they invented the index fund, lo almost the lowest fees I can find on index funds. Fidelity is great as well. Um, T. Rowe Price is great. Um, any of those are great places. But start with your, your, your bank if you want to, but I think you're going to get more options at Vanguard or Fidelity. 
uh, and you can buy any kind of mutual fund or index fund you want, stocks, bonds, US, foreign, whatever you want, they're all there. But just start, just get educated. Don't get overwhelmed. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room to do this. You just need to start. You need to consistently invest. Build your business, but let your business profit make money for you so that it's you working, but also your money working for you. And then you'll be in really good shape. Thanks for listening. As we wrap up, I would love to hear from you. Either leave a review on iTunes. If you haven't already left one, then I would say, please leave a review on iTunes for the podcast. Let me know you're listening, that you like it. It helps me out uh, with the Apple's algorithm, um, but also I get to know what you like. Or you can always email me. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can leave a comment. Or you can DM me on Instagram. Let me know if these two episodes have been helpful to you as we've been thinking about money and money management. I threw a lot at you in two episodes. I debated going to three but I wanted to just do it in two. Let me know if these have been helpful and what was the biggest takeaway, the biggest win for you during either of these episodes. I'm very curious. I would love to know. And then if you have any more money questions, if you just want to talk more about money and how we think about money as business owners, I'm happy to dive in. There's a lot we could cover uh, and there's a lot of juicy bullets that are very practical day in and day out, things that we mess with uh, as business owners and human beings. But thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. I'm honored to have your ear I know you spent a lot of time with me today, so go enjoy the rest of your day. Be wise. Plan for your future. Your future self will thank you for it. We'll see you on next week's episode.